Hello, everybody, and thank you very much for the opportunity to speak here. Um, I'm working with Phoenix as a user since more than four years now, and since then I'm trying to uh, implement a decent micromagnetic code. And today I want to present to you um, how far I've come. So, um, down is this is uh, the outline of my talk. I will start and give you an introduction to the theory of micromagnetics. Um, then I will focus on some implementation details on Magnum FE. And in the last section, I will show you some, I call them Phoenix hacks, which solve some uh, small problems that we have in a way that Phoenix didn't meant to be used, I guess. And uh, finally, I will conclude. So, um, as you might know, uh, a ferromagnet basically consists of a large number of elementary magnets, and each of these elementary magnets is basically a magnetic dipole, and these dipoles interact with each other through uh, different mechanisms. Um, so, one of these mechanisms would be uh, the simple interaction with an external field, which we call Seaman field. Um, in that case, uh, the elementary ma uh, magnet would try to align in parallel to this external field. And uh, the next contribution, which is quite important, is the so-called demagnetization field, also called stray field or magnetostatic field. And so every of these elementary magnets does not only react in external fields, but also generate fields, in that case, a dipole. And that means that every other elementary magnet has to align in the field generated by every other magnet, uh, which looks like this. And so this is obviously a bidirectional coupling. That means the other magnet also generates a field. And if we put in more and more um, elementary magnets, we see that it's energetically favored that we get closed magnetic flux. And that's why this field is also called demagnetization field, because all in all, um, this energy contribution will try to demagnetize the whole sample. So um, when there was only this interaction, then how comes that there are microscopic magnets which have a microscopic magnetization? Uh, the reason for this lies in the exchange interaction, which is a quantum mechanical effect and which is present in ferromagnets. And basically, it says that neighboring, um, neighboring uh, elementary magnets um, like to be aligned in parallel. So um, what makes this whole problem interesting from a computational point of view is that we have these two competing um, contributions. One is very local, the exchange field, and tries to align every magnet in parallel. And uh, the other is a global contribution, which kind of competes uh, with the exchange field in trying to demagnetize the whole sample. Um, so when we want to compute this, um, we obviously have to look at every elementary magnet. And that means if we look at the microscopic uh, sample, which consists of over 10 to the power of 23 magnets, we sort of run into problems. So what we do, uh, or what the micromagnetic model does, it takes this discrete description of the magnet and turns it into a continuous description. And um, then we take all these field contributions and formulate them um, in terms of PDEs, and then we can use spatial discretization to tackle the problem. Um, so until now, I only uh, showed to you some like static contributions of how the magnets want to be in an energetic equilibrium. Um, but we are also interested in the dynamics of the magnetization, and this is described by the landau lifshitz gilbert equation. So this equation basically consists of two terms. So on the left-hand side is the temporal derivative of the magnetization field. And then here we have two, uh, two terms. One uh, is called the precession term. And as you can see in this figure, it makes the magnetization spin around an effective field. And the second one is called the damping term. And this accounts for dissipative effects in the material. And it makes the magnetization to drop into the effective field. Um, so all in all, the magnetization will perform a kind of a spiral motion around the effective field. While the effective field is connected to the energy contributions I showed to you on the slide before by this variational derivative. So U is the energy, M is the magnetization. And 
we can describe the effective field in, as a sum of different contributions, uh, like the Seaman field, the demagnetization field, uh, on, and so on. Um, okay. So Magnum FE. Um, this is a short overview of the features of Magnum FE. Magnum FE is uh, able to describe the magnetization dynamics as described by the Lando Lifshitz Gilbert equation, um, including, sorry, including the exchange field, the demagnetization field. The demagnetization field is actually a Poisson problem with um, open boundary conditions, and that's why we treat it uh, with finite element method coupled to a boundary element method. I will go a bit into detail later. Um, and many more contributions, for example, an Ersted field, which is a field generated by an electric current, a spin torque, which describes um, the interaction of the spins carried by uh, conducting electrons with the magnetization, um, and some more physical effects that are not that important right now. So what are the key challenges in uh, implementing such a software? So first off, um, we uh, most of the problems we are trying to solve, um, like are pretty complicated stacks of different materials, and each material, um, other laws, uh, other physical laws apply. For example, um, if we want to consider these um, these effects that are connected to electric currents, we do not only have to describe the magnet, but we also have to describe the conductor. So we have different domains and some. Subproblems are solved only on subdomains, and other problems are solved on the whole domain. So domain handling is a problem or a challenge. Uh, and the next thing is, um, are these differing contributions, some of them might be very expensive to compute. So um, depending on what we are interested in when we are looking at a physical system, we want to be able to use these building blocks in flexible uh, like stack them together in order to describe the whole physical problem. And so uh, what I, this is something I will go into detail uh, on the next slides. Um, there, there are some in intermediate computations and some dependency handling we added so that we can flexibly um, describe complex and simple problems with the software. Then the next thing I already mentioned, um, we have this open boundary problem, which is pretty important. Um, um, this we solve by interfacing with the library BAM++. And this is rather small problems. Uh, as you might have seen from the lano lifshitz gilbert equation that uh, the magnetization module is, is conserved at any time. So when integrating the magnetization over time, um, we should use some algorithm that like takes account for this constraint because when we look at large time scales, we want the magnetization to have this constant modulus. Um, okay, so uh, the basic data structure in, um, in the Magnum FE simulation is the state class and the state class holds almost everything from, uh, from the simulation, starting um, with the mesh and all the material information and all the simulation state, that means the time, magnetization, and so on. And obviously for um, like spatial dependent entries like the magnetization, we can use standard Phoenix expressions like this expression, or we can load something from a function, or we can use constants and so, and so on. Um, okay, so how do we handle multiple domains? Um, this is a typical multi-layer stack. Uh, so we have two magnetic layers, the blue one and the red one, and they are connected with a conducting layer and two electrodes. And so what we want, we, we want to be able to address, say, the complete magnetic region to tell Magnum FE, like, solve something on the magnetic region. But we also want to be able to address only one region to set some initial uh, magnetization configuration or something like that. And so uh, we came up with this, uh, like, naming of domains. Um, so within Phoenix, it's possible to handle domains by giving them um, unique identifiers uh, as integers. And so we um, like introduce a naming convention where the same ID can be used for different names. And 
then later on we can use these given names to uh, do some stuff. Uh, this is shown here. For example, if we named our domains, we can set the material in only one region or in everything but the region. Um, then Phoenix offers its own uh, measures, which are uh, aware of these named domains. So we can, like, define uh, UFL, uh, UFL expressions on certain subdomains. Then we uh, um, decorate all the fields in the state with some methods. So we, we are able to, like, crop the magnetization if we want to do in a post-processing step if we are only interested in the magnetization dynamics, then um, why should we, oops, save everything when it's uh, sufficient to save the magnetization in the areas where it really exists? We can compute averages um, and we can like mask the whole state. That means we, um, we give a domain name here and this mask method um, returns a decorated state that basically acts only on part of the mesh. So um, this can be used by, uh, by other modules to, say, solve the problem only in the conducting region or only in the magnetic region and so on. Um, okay, so the next thing would be the dependency handling. So a standard, a very simple simulation um, would look like this. In order to um, integrate the magnetization in time, um, we need to compute the time derivative of the magnetization, which depends on different uh, effective field contributions. In this case, the exchange field and the demagnetization field, and these in turn depend on the current magnetization state, and also this one uh, depends on the magnetization state. Then we add things like an external field. In this case, it's a simple input, but maybe we want to add an oscillating field so that makes the Siemen field also an intermediate result because we kind of have to compute from the actual simulation time how the field looks like. And it's get more, uh, it gets more complicated if we look at this interaction of electric currents with the magnetization. So we have this um, talk term where um, the current picks up some of the magnetization and the spin, um, spin polarized current then interacts with the magnetization. So this term does not only depend on the magnetization, but also on the electric current. But the current, in turn, may depend on the magnetization. You may be heard of the GMR effect. Um, so things get more and more complicated. Um, now the current depends on the magnetization and some input condition on the boundaries. And maybe these input conditions can um, depend on the time again. And now, uh, this intermediate result at this moment is only used by the spin torque module, but maybe there is another module like the Ørsted field which, which also needs this result. So we have to take care that this is not computed twice because this might be very expensive. So, um, so we introduced the concept we call virtual attributes. Um, so everything in the state, like in this case the magnetization, can be either a constant or um, if it's a virtual attribute, it's basically a lambda, or you can plug in a function or whatever. And this function um, uh, should return a tuple. And this, the first value of the tuple is the result of the computation. And every other value in the tuple gives the dependencies of this virtual attribute. So in this case, we define a virtual attribute which uh, should average the magnetic state, and we tell the virtual attribute that it depends on the magnetization. So if we set the magnetization and call the virtual attribute, the lambda is actually called and returns the average. And if we call it again, the cache value is returned. If we now reset the magnetization, the lambda is called again, the cache is expired, and uh, the average is computed again. And this can be, um, so these, these dependencies can be not only one value, but also many. Like in this case, this might um, we might want to have a virtual attribute that depends on the magnetization and the time, and so on. Um, yeah. Okay. So this is something um, we use in order to flexibly stack in all the modules 
um, like we need for a search simulation. Um, okay, next thing is interfacing libraries. Um, so this is the only slide I have uh, concerning the boundary element method because the next speaker is going to talk, um, go into detail on that point, I guess. But um, yeah, some things can't be done with Phoenix. One example would be the coupling to the boundary element method. And um, another thing would be a, use an external time integrator or whatever. And we have very good experiences in using NumPy for interfacing other libraries because almost every scientific library has some kind of NumPy bindings nowadays. And yeah, the pros is you can use for almost any library. It's fast, the counts is, I guess it breaks par parallel code because you always pull the whole vector um, if you use the NumPy interface. And it's only efficient if you have to uh, communicate vectors. If, if you want to communicate matrices, I guess you lose the sparsity information. Um, this is a simple example. Um, you get some mapping here, and basically you have a, a Phoenix function here, and then we call a method from the BEM++ library, and as an argument, we give this um, NumPy array with the mapping. And so this is copying the vector to the BEM library, and this is the other way around. So we have some result in, in the BEM directory in, in, in the UBEM function, and then we put it back into the vector. And um, when experimenting with this um, NumPy interface, uh, we realized that uh, some things can be done in more than one way, uh, but some ways are slow and some ways are very fast. So this is a simple example. If you have a function and um, you have a NumPy array with the same size as the vector of the function and you want to copy the, the Phoenix vector into the NumPy function, then uh, this code is very fast and this code does essentially the same but is much slower. So um, you guys probably know why, what's the reason for this. I just I wanted to make a point that you have to be careful how to use this NumPy interface. It might be slow, but it might also be very fast. Okay, now I come to the uh, last section, two small hacks we use. Um, so the first thing is for some operations in our code, we need node-wise evaluation. Um, for instance, um, I told you that the modulus of the magnetization is supposed to be constant over time. So what we do is uh, every once in a while we renormalize the magnetization um, just by, oh, sorry, just by dividing a vector field M by the square root of M times N. And we want this to be done on the node. So we want the magnetization to be normalized in every node. And mm, so Phoenix itself doesn't support these operations at the moment, so we came up with this small hack. We uh, just introduce a test function, um, and then we assemble a vector where we use the point measure. And yeah, this way, with this assemble call, we get a node-wise normalized vector. Um, yeah, and this is connected to a feature request. There is also, uh, there, there's an open issue. Um, and yeah, the feature request would be um, to have something like an interpolate method for uh, arbitrary UFL expressions. And yeah, because right now, this hack does only work for simple function spaces like CG1. And the, the other hack we are using is I told you that some of the problems we are solving on the whole mesh and some only on the sub mesh and sometimes it's convenient to really pull the data to a sub, to, to a real mesh object that represents the sub mesh, solve it, and then copy it back to some function that lives on the uh, complete mesh. And we do it like this. So um, um, what we do is we uh, compute a mapping between the function space that lives on the submesh and the function space that lives on the mesh by just initializing a vector of, um, so we, we uh, create a function on the, 
of the big mesh of some function space, and then we just fill the vector of these functions with like numbers from zero to n minus one, and then we use interpolate to interpolate the function on the sub mesh, and then by just um, like typecasting the float values of this result to you uh, to an integer values, we directly get a uh, an array that contains the mapping of the degrees of freedom on the sub mesh and the mesh for that particular function space. And that should work for every kind of function space. Um, this is pretty fast also. So this is what we are using to switch meshes. And yeah, that's it. The conclusion, here you can find the code. Uh, and in conclusion, um, Magnum FE written in Phoenix is almost competitive with the C code that was developed in our group years ago. Um, but it's much easier to extend. And um, like right now, the downsides are that we cannot compute in parallel due to all these hacks I showed you and uh, due to external libraries and stuff. And uh, yeah, we, we have some problems getting Magnum FE to work on our local computation cluster. So this is right now a, a downside of this approach to use Phoenix in production, I would say. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention. I guess. I mean, it's open source, so I don't know if every, uh, anyone downloaded it and uses it, but I, I know of not. Um, yeah, we tried to install Phoenix with hash test a few times, and the last time we were trying the, it, everything went well, but then when compiling Dolphin, the compiler was too old. There is only GCC 4.7 six or so installed. And we have a Docker container running with Magnum FE, which we use internally on a compute node we have. But um, yeah, the cluster guys were not able to get Docker up and running. So we are hoping that, that we can use Docker as a solution for that. I would just like to comment that maybe, maybe we should also look at um, maybe Phoenix simply wanting to always have the SG that's, if you want to have all these features, you create problems for people want to install things on hardware software, which isn't as fast developing. relative time between the FEM section and yeah. Ah, okay. Um, so we, um, we use uh, a very simple coupling, which is called fracking cooler coupling for this particular problem, where we only have to apply the double layer operator one. So we don't have to solve any system with these dense matrices. Uh, so it's really quick. It's so the fa FEM part is the most expensive one in that case. Uh, we tried some hundred thousands of nodes, but that's really slow. I mean, usually we are interested in long time scales, so the problem is not to fit real, really big problems into memory, but the problem is more that we have to like compute hundred thousands of time steps to get some reasonable results. So we almost always use much smaller measures. Um, if we, um, we have different time integrators and for one time integrator we are using the time step is like 10 to the power of minus 12 seconds. 
Ah, so, uh, you mean the computation time for one times the? Can you try? What's the order of convergence of your time step? Ah, okay. Um, the one that's in the open source version is uh, first order, and we have we are experimenting with the um, with a BDF of higher order um, library that it's not published yet. Yeah, actually, we are like hundred times faster if we use this external library. 